Good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you for that warm welcome. Although I should warn you to be careful, because it's not going to take much encouragement for me to go all South London on you, I can tell you. I could easily spend the next 20 minutes getting stuck into the governments of Northern Ireland, Wales and England for their abject failure to support the profession and the children in your care. Three administrations playing fast and loose with children's futures and the future prosperity of these nations. In fact, I think I'll do just that. But before the fun starts, I should give you a warm welcome to our annual conference. It's a mark of the times that this year we have almost doubled the number of delegates compared to last year, and I'm thrilled that our conference is growing in line with our ambition. I'd particularly like to welcome any first-time delegates here today. Uh, I hope you have a great couple of days, and I think that I can remember our president at some point saying how he'd like to buy you all a drink, so make sure he does that tonight. <laughs> uh, can you tell that I'm in the mood for demanding fair reward? Um, I know that many of you in this room uh, work hard on behalf of the NAHT in your capacity as officials, campaigners, uh, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for everything that you've done to grow this union into what it's become. You have my thanks, but Paul can buy you the beer. Uh, but seriously, the growth and progress uh, NHC has enjoyed in recent years is down to your hard work, and I'm proud as punch to serve as your General Secretary. And I'm a lucky man too, lucky to have a fantastic staff team that never flinches when the next challenge arises. Thank you, thank you all. You've been extraordinary this year. You've been an extraordinary team this year, and uh, I was just about to invite Conference to clap and show their appreciation too, but, but Conference is ahead of me. I always like it when Conference is ahead of me. I'm also lucky to have a dedicated and straightforward National Executive Committee. You hold me to account, but you never fail to take tough policy decisions, never fail to listen to advice, and you're generous with your own advice, guidance, and support for the team. You're ambitious for our members and, and ambitious for the children in your schools too. Never change. The progress we make is because we're an outward-looking union. Now, my last mark of appreciation is for our president, Dr. Gods, as we call him. Now, there has to be some way to distinguish the two of us apart, right? We're both Pauls, we're both bald, we've both kept our looks, of course, uh, both sometimes bespectacled, both with London accents, and a little more than a passing resemblance between us. But it turns out that it's brain size that's the difference, hence the doctor. But Paul, intellect is no guarantee of staying out of trouble, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've served as GS under six presidents now, every single one of them a blessing all impressive and thoughtful. But I have to reflect, Paul, it's only under your presidency that we've had a president called the Secretary of State Feller, <laughs> that, we, that we've called for industrial action not just in one country but in three, that we're taking action short of strike in Wales and a day of strike action in Northern Ireland, and I have no doubt we will secure a mandate in England too. Uh, and we've also begun action against the inspector and campaigned on funding too. So, Simon, just a note for you. I'm hoping for a quiet year next year. <laughs> now, let's just go over the quiet year we've had this year again to make sure we have something to talk about. Three industrial action ballots, standing up to Ofsted's brutal and destructive inspection regime, campaigning for and securing an extra four billion in funding, nowhere near enough, but it wouldn't have happened without the NAHT and our sister unions undertaking industrial action in both Wales and Northern Ireland, and now another ballot in England. But outside of all that, I don't really think there's much to tell you. In fact, I imagine we'll run out of things by tomorrow, and I'll be back to see Crystal Palace beating West Ham by half-time. Uh, I'm joking, of course. Crystal Palace never score in the first half. <laughs> um, but truth is, we've got an agenda packed with brilliant motions, brilliant speakers, and I hope you're as excited as I am about the next couple of days. Conference. Our theme this year is strength in mutual support and power in collective endeavour. And my word, haven't we seen those values displayed in their droves over the last year? Now, the last, now last year, in a demonstration of contempt for you, the previous Secretary of State snubbed this conference, choosing to visit a party, party fundraising event a couple of miles up the road instead of coming here. You were rightly indignant about that, and I think we saw the writing on the wall then, if truth be told. 
Now, for the second year running, the Secretary of State is not with us at conference, but to be fair to Gillian, she's not snubbed us and we've not snubbed her. We are formally in dispute with government and talks have broken down. It simply would not have been appropriate. But we do look forward to a resolution to the dispute and inviting Gillian to next year's conference. But conference, because she's not here, that means you need to be loud and you need to be heard. So I want you at this conference to shout and stamp your feet like never before and make sure your views are heard. Relentlessly reasonable, yes, but we will not cower and we will not beg. Send that message from this conference loud and clear. Now, will the delegation from Wales please stand up? I can see you. There's just over on this side of the hall. Up you get for a moment. <laughs> Colleagues, our sisters and brothers in Wales secured a ballot result and they've been engaged in industrial action that's procured a pay deal that is sufficient. But the dispute continues because despite promised government funding, the local authorities in Wales refuse to promise to pass that money on to schools. That's a disgrace and we will not stop until it's solved. Congratulations, colleagues. You and your members can be proud of your achievements and a solid campaign. And residing just next door to ours over at this corner, would the delegation from Northern Ireland please stand up for a moment? Come on, on your feet. Colleagues in Northern Ireland have been engaged in action shorter strike for some time now, but on Wednesday of this week, they joined all public sector workers in a single day of strike action, joining teaching unions and public sector workers in a protest in Belfast to protect education. It was a really difficult decision, I know, but our action was solid and we were central to the Belfast rally. Now, the government in Northern Ireland boasted that they had nothing to worry about. School leaders would never stand up for themselves. Well, colleagues, they know better now, don't they? Colleagues, please show some support. So, now in England, it's time to ballot again. NHT members voted to take action earlier this year. We got close, but we didn't, we didn't get past the arbitrary 50% threshold. Despite that, NHT tried to maintain solidarity with striking NEU members in as many ways as possible. And this is, as this is a fight for the profession, and I'm really pleased that Kevin Courtney is with us uh, just down in the corner there, uh, together with the NEU president. <laughs> we will later be joined by Jeff Barton from Ashgall and Patrick Roach from the NSUWT as well. I'm pleased that the, that the NHC was, was a central part of the negotiations with government, with government as a consequence of our ongoing campaign. Together, the unions brought the government to the table, but their offer fell short of what was needed. In fact, the offer was so poor, it's seen NAHT member attitude harden. It was rank and file members that rejected the offer with a crushing vote against. In just a week, and that was a week that went into the Easter holidays, 64% of members cast their vote, with 90% rejecting the government's offer, and 78% of our members demanding to be balloted for industrial action. Colleagues, the NEC has heard that plea, and they resolved to call for an, for an industrial action ballot yesterday afternoon, and I'm confident the conference will endorse that decision today. The government must now come back to the table. Simply taking their bat and ball home because our members have said no is not the action of a responsible government. It's a demonstration of contempt for the profession and a lack of concern for children. Now, I said at the time of our ballot result that if the government failed to reopen negotiations, they would be turning their backs on children. Now, that seems to have upset an unnamed source at the DfE, saying that the NHT seemed determined to turn up the temperature, last week threatening to sue Ofs Ofsted and this week accusing the government of turning its back on children. But what was really revealing about what that source said is what they didn't respond to. Because I also said that failing to come back to the negotiating table would be the government sticking two fingers up to the profession as well. There was no attempt from government to correct that one. So we know how they feel about you. It's absolutely clear. Colleagues, you should not be subjected to this. Let's face it, we are miss what we're missing from politicians is leadership and commitment to education. In Northern Ireland, politicians simply don't turn up for work. 
In Wales, they lack either the power or the commitment to command compliance with the deals that they strike. And in England, I'm on my eighth Secretary of State since becoming General Secretary. It's a shambles. We've had warm words about the value of schools and educators, but it's hard to attribute any credibility to those sentiments when most people in this room have lost any sort of confidence in a Secretary of State lasting longer than the blossom in spring. Clean and fresh, with plenty of promise, but gone in the blink of an eye. The point is, the words of this administration amount to very little. It's their actions, or rather the lack of them, that have shown us how far down their list of priorities we are. Only a few weeks ago, the government's own data illustrated the crushing workload that has been burning out teachers and school leaders. Full-time leaders now work an average, an average of 57 and a half hours a week, and their reward, a real terms pay cut of nearly 20% nearly 20 since 2010. That isn't fair, it isn't right, and most importantly, conference, it's unsustainable. So how many school leaders would recommend their career path to others? A third, just one third. That statistic alone should be enough to shame the whole country. How can that not be anything other than a massive red flag to government that says something isn't right? And if that wasn't enough, we know that one in three school leaders are leaving their roles within five years of appointment, with half of those leaving state-funded education entirely. But why? Well, I'll tell you, government, you're overworking and underpaying the people who run our schools and asking them to do so with scant resource or investment. Conference, it's perhaps apt that we've convened here in the heart of the country, because I genuinely believe that we are engaged in a fight for the heart and soul for education. I can't put it more clearly. If the government cares about the future of young people, they must massively invest in the whole system teachers, schools and children, and that needs to happen now. No more empty promises, no more smoke and mirrors with numbers, a genuine financial investment. We've been on this cliff edge for far too long and enough is enough. The spectacle of underfunded schools, along with overworked and underpaid staff, working within the context of a punitive inspection system, inspection regime, is unsurprisingly not the solution our recruitment and retention, the solution to our recruitment and retention crisis. It's damaging to our profession, it's damaging to the children you teach, and it's entirely unsustainable. Now, as educators, you are the experts at identifying when someone fails to grasp a concept. And it's clear to all of us that this government just doesn't get it. They were shocked when we rejected their pay offer, which illustrates just how little they understand about the situation inside schools. So let me say to them now, you can avoid all the problems you like. Cut corners, ignore appeals from the experts, pretend you've been taking action and hope no one notices when you don't follow through on your promises. But what prize do you get for that? A slightly more palatable bottom line in exchange for selling young people down the river and sending a message to the rest of the world that this country, we just don't think education is that important. When it comes to school funding, the government have attempted to fob off the general public with massage figures and deceptive statistics. But it doesn't matter if you've been made to study maths until the age of 18 or 180. Their sums just don't add up. <laughs> the truth is, the truth is that school funding is still below the level it was 13 years ago in real terms. Now, they can try and dazzle us with the talk of record funding increases, blind us with their figures in millions and billions, and re-emphasise their commitment to the sector, but they can't pull the wool over your eyes. Schools are poorer than they were almost 15 years ago, and that's the undisputable truth. Now, colleagues, we could talk about government all day long, and no doubt we will do for much of it, but we can't talk about institutions not listening without talking about Ofsted. For years, we've told Ofsted and the DfE that the current approach to inspection does more harm than good. We warned them repeatedly about the negative impact on school leaders and their staff. We told them the current framework was not fit for purpose. In 2018, we ran our own accountability commission. 
and showed that there was a better alternative. But despite that advice, an arbitrary and excess excessively punitive inspection regime, which damages the health of school leaders, still exists. Now, conference, I have no doubt you all saw the news coverage regarding the tragic death of Ruth Perry, a head teacher from Reading who took her own life shortly after an inspection. In the immediate aftermath of Ruth's passing, NHT experienced a significant increase in calls to our advice line from similarly distressed members. And you know, the saddest thing about that is that I doubt anybody in this room is surprised. Now, we are honoured and grateful that Ruth's sister, Julia, will be joining us and addressing our conference tomorrow morning. But Julia, until then, let me say on behalf of everyone at NAHT that we once again express our sympathy and our condolences to you and your family at such a difficult time. This union stands with you. Ruth was one of us. She could have been any one of us. There are no two ways about it. This has to be a watershed moment for Ofsted. Change has to come, and it has to come quickly. <laughs> School leaders have never shied away from accountability and scrutiny, but we do ask for a fair, humane, proportionate inspection system that seeks to support schools, not punish them. So our decision to take the first steps towards legal action and issue a pre-action protocol letter was not taken lightly, but it was absolutely necessary. And I can tell you that NHT lawyers are working right now, as I speak, putting the finishing touches to a legal challenge. And let me tell you why. The arrogance of Ofsted towards our members is breathtaking. The refusal of the Chief Inspector to sit down with us and agree adjustments, that's agree adjustments to inspection practices that would bring immediate relief to the situation is reckless. It's no good talking to us and then going away and thinking about it for a while about what you might want to do. You have to agree with us, the people at the other end of your inspection, what needs to be done to make work safe. And you need to do it fast. Because colleagues, at the end of the day, this is what it's about, health and safety at work. If an unsafe practice had been identified on a building site or in a factory, it is quite simply so stopped until a safer working practice is designed and identified and agreed with the workers to protect everybody. So why are things different for professionals? Why do you think it's acceptable to be reckless with the lives of school, of school leaders and reckless with their well-being? Shame on you, Ofsted. Now, we're not just a union of leaders, we're a union that leads when it matters. And that's why our union has grown by 40% over the course of the last five years. We're a union that suggests solutions alongside pointing out problems. And the situation with Ofsted is no exception. So let me be clear about what needs to happen next. Firstly, we need to see the introduction of immediate actions that will begin to relieve some pressure, some of the pressure on school leaders. This won't solve every problem, but in the light of recent events, tangible changes need to be implemented now. We also need to see a fundamental reform of inspection in this country. And whilst I don't want to preempt your, uh, your policy decisions tomorrow, this simply must include an end to simplistic and pernicious one-word grading systems. And we're here to help. I call on this or any future government to work with us on designing something which is both fairer and more effective for everyone. In doing so, it's entirely achievable and absolutely necessary. Conference, education is at a crossroads. As a nation, we can either take action now or do immeasurable damage to both the teaching profession and the prospects of our young people for many generations to come. So my message to government is this. Make education your first priority. If you genuinely value how schools shape the prospects of future generations, then put education at the top of the list. It's within your gift to make this country world leading when it comes to education, so do that and start doing that today. Make us number one. Now, delegates, we're going to have a great conference. 
It's going to be great because of your passion, your ideas, professionalism, and your dedication to your pupils and your colleagues. Despite the challenges that I've cited in this speech, you still have the best and most important jobs in the world, with the very best people occupying them and the most incredible young people in our schools being educated by them. The joy of seeing pupils fulfill their potential can't be matched. And if the problems we've discussed could be adequately addressed, who knows how much more we could achieve together. So in just a few moments, we're going to start voting on motions that will direct the work of this union over the course of the next year. So please throw yourself into that occasion and vote with your whole hearts. We've got some difficult decisions to make, and before I go, I'd just like to impress on you the great responsibility that you've taken on by being part of that process. We are leaders, and part of leadership is leading by example. Leading by example when it comes to what's right. Leading by example when it comes to trying to fix something that is broken. Leading by example in the pursuit of fairness and leading by example when it means taking action and standing up for what you believe in. So when you do take action, remember you are doing it not just for you, you're doing it to protect education on behalf of the nation. So when they say, what about children, stand firm and stand proud and answer you're doing it for the children. And when they say you're damaged the reputation of education, Stand firm and stand proud and say you're doing it, you're standing up for education. And when they say this country hasn't got any money, stand firm, stand strong and explain this is the sixth richest nation in the world and you're doing it for the nation's future. Now let's get to work. Thank you, conference. Thank you.